So, you just finished watching through Futurama and you're not quite ready for it to be over yet. Or maybe you finished it when it ended seven years ago and you've been depressed about it ever since. Even now, seven years later, people are still begging for the show to be brought back from the dead yet again. Well, for you Futurama fans who just need one last dose of your favorite incompetent delivery crew, I have... Good news, everyone! Throughout the series' life and even after, there have been multiple stories produced outside of the official series run. While Futurama diehards likely know about these extracurricular adventures, I'm gonna guessing not everybody does, and the stories behind them are pretty interesting themselves. Plus, they were all written and produced by the actual Futurama writing team, so buckle up and let's talk about the not one, not two, but three lost Futurama episodes that you might not know about, and even a few extras on the back end. I'm gonna get into some spoiler territory here, so I'll briefly introduce each story and where you can watch them before we jump into spoilers, and I'll put time codes in the description if you want to go spoiler free. First up is Futurama The Game, also known as Futurama The Lost Adventure. The game itself released on PlayStation 2 and Xbox in August 2003, which means it was written and produced right around the same time as the fourth production season of Futurama, the final production season of the original run on Fox. It was written by Jay Stewart Burns, who wrote a handful of episodes throughout Futurama's run, including the Emmy award-winning Roswell That Ends Well. This is effectively just an episode of Futurama with action platforming levels in between each scene, though obviously instead of the 2D animation you're used to, it's this old-school 3D video game style. This is an obvious hurdle that might turn some viewers away, it's not going to look quite quite as good as the traditional Futurama episode. The characters that are more symmetrical, like Bender, the Professor, and Zoidberg, actually translate really well to 3D. Nothing looks too odd or out of place, but characters like Fry and Leela, who have very specific and stylized hair, look a little odd at certain angles. Plus, look at Leela's hair. This is clearly more pink than purple. But if the graphical style doesn't trigger you, you are in for a pretty fun Futurama adventure. There are a few ways you can watch this story. The first is obviously, go get yourself a copy of the game, pop it into your Xbox or PS2, and play through it. This is what I did back in the mid-2000s before the cutscenes were available anywhere else. Alternatively, if you've got the Futurama movie, The Beast with a Billion Backs on DVD, congrats, you have access to The Lost Adventure. They even have a commentary track with the cast and writers, which is pretty enlightening. And lastly, you could find yourself a Let's Play or YouTube video of all of the cutscenes strung together, but there are actually some key differences between the DVD version of The Lost Adventure and playing through the actual game itself. And I want to talk about all of that, so let's jump into spoiler territory. Spoilers ahead for the plot of Futurama The Game. If you don't want to be spoiled, skip to the time code below. So as I mentioned, there are some key differences in content between playing through the game or watching a cutscene compilation and watching the DVD version of The Lost Adventure. And there are pros and cons to each. The Futurama team decided to try and make The Lost Adventure as much like a real episode as possible so they actually remove some of the jokes and dialogue that break the fourth wall and reference the fact that they're in fact a video game. Like this one. So what was death like, Fry? Well, first everything went dark. Then this bright light appeared and it said, game over. Or this one. So now I can die and come back to life like Fry? Does that mean? Yes, you're a playable character. Personally, I'm not convinced this was necessary. I understand the inclination, but why remove jokes? People know this was a game. In fact, the premise of the episode still revolves around devices that recreate video game mechanics. But they did make some good additions as well. They added in the actual title sequence of the series with the subtitle The Lost Adventure. Plus, they added in a ton of new sound effects from the actual series to give it a little extra level of polish. So, if you go with The Lost Adventure, you'll miss out on some fun video game centric jokes, but you'll gain a little more production value overall. It's cut in a nice, tight little package. And the best news is that overall, the story is very funny. Sci fi wise, it's nothing too exciting. Exciting, but the cutscenes are filled with that classic Futurama goodness and gags that will for sure make you laugh. And you died! <laughs> it was so funny! The plot of the episode is simple enough. Good news, everyone! I've sold Planet Express to Mom! Get your <gasps> bum up, dude! After the professor sells Planet Express to Mom, she officially owns over 50% of the planet and therefore is its new ruler. So then, as Mom does, she becomes a totalitarian dictator. The crew escapes Earth just as Mom turns the entire planet into a giant planet-sized spaceship, but she needs Farnsworth's dark matter engine in order to power it. Mom kidnaps the professor's head, hooks him into her death planet, and starts destroying planets to take over the universe. There are a ton of fun visual gags and references too, like when they visit this planet in the corner of the universe, that planet is actually called Boga, 
Dagobad, which rearranged can spell Dagobah, and they arrive there to find a character named Adoy, which is of course Yoda spelled backwards, one of the many Star Wars references throughout the series. This is also one of the many Futurama stories to feature time travel. The crew uses this time machine to go back in time to try and stop the Professor from selling Planet Express in the first place. It doesn't quite go as planned, and the Professor sells it anyways, which technically I think makes this story stuck in some kind of time loop, and also means I don't think it can be considered canon, since it would imply Mom succeeded in taking over the entire universe. But it's still a really fun story. That being said, not everything about the adventure works seamlessly. A lot of the story takes place during actual gameplay sequences. The Lost Adventure showcases a bit of gameplay to try and bridge the gap between these sequences, but it still doesn't always feel like it flows particularly well. There are a few times where it really does just feel like it jumps forward in time without any real explanation as to how or why. Huh. You wouldn't think a god could be mortally wounded. This is where playing through the actual game will give a bit more thorough understanding of the sequences of events, but there's also a lot of gameplay in between cutscenes, so that isn't a perfect experience either. I think if you're just looking for some good Futurama gags and a general understanding of the overall story, watch the cutscenes or the Lost Adventure on your Beast with a Billion Backs DVD, but if you're a Futurama diehard and are willing to play through the sometimes difficult and frustrating gameplay, the game itself is the way to go. There are lots of fun little Easter eggs and references sprinkled throughout the levels, but be warned, it is not an easy game. John DiMaggio and some of the other cast and crew talked about how even they couldn't beat it on the episode commentary. I, I got really far in the game. I got stuck in the... I couldn't hop from place to place. It pissed me <laughs> off. Man, I was so angry. I've actually got my own copy, and it took me a long time to beat back in the day. I picked this game up after the series had ended for the first time, but before the show was revived with the straight-to-DVD movies. Look, I was desperate for more Futurama, all right? I did what I had to do. And even though it was pretty hard, overall, beating the game was a pretty satisfying experience. And that's a wrap on Futurama's first Lost episode, so let's jump into the next one, which didn't come until after Futurama had ended its final season on Comedy Central, and is probably the most well-known of these Lost adventures. That's right, the Simpsons Futurama crossover from The Simpsons Season 26, which aired in 2014, about a year after the series finale of Futurama. The episode was announced almost immediately after The Simpsons Guy, the long-awaited Family Guy slash Simpsons crossover, but Simpsorama was rightfully much better received. Like the Futurama game, Simpsorama was also written by J. Stewart Burns, a good choice given that he had written on both Futurama and The Simpsons, although personally I maybe would have gone with Bill Odenkirk, no disrespect to Burns though, because this episode was a ton of fun. Talking about the crossover and Entertainment Weekly, showrunner Al Jean said, They were going off the air, so I thought people would really love it if we had one more chance to see those characters. We're always looking for things that are compatible with us, and I thought, well, what's more compatible? And personally, I'm glad they did. This is one of my favorite Simpsons episodes in the past 20 years. If you're looking to watch this episode, the best way to see it is definitely on Disney+, Plus, where the first 31 seasons of The Simpsons are currently streaming. So with that, let's jump into episode spoilers. Spoilers ahead for Simpsorama. Jump to this time code if you want to jump past spoilers to the final Lost episode. Simpsorama starts with a pretty great Futurama slash Simpsons mashup title sequence that ends in a very funny hedonism bot centric couch gag. Overall, the novelty of seeing the Simpsons and Futurama characters interact is pretty fun. The episode revolves around Bender going back in time to kill Homer because his DNA was detected in a race of evil demon bunnies that are destroying the future. These demons were actually created when Bart blew his nose in an egg salad sandwich and put it in a time capsule with Milhouse's lucky rabbit's foot, which all then mutated by toxic waste from the nuclear power plant. Eventually, the rest of the Futurama crew joins Bender in Springfield, and we get some fun team-ups between Futurama and Simpsons characters. Bender and Homer hit it off. Leela and Marge have a funny moment. Oh, don't mention her eye. Don't mention her eye. Don't mention her hair. Don't mention her hair. Professors Farnsworth and Frank try to solve the sci-fi problem, and probably the most fun, Bender and Maggie hang out at the horse track. The last act of the episode has all of the characters sucked back into the future, so we get to spend a little bit more time in New New York as well. Overall, the episode delivered what I hoped it would, a fun little victory lap for my favorite Futurama characters after the show had ended, and those Simpsons slash Futurama interactions many of us had only dreamed about. It also had some great meta humor about the two shows, like this bit about how Homer and Bender look a lot alike. A little lazy, if you ask me. But there were a few things that felt a little off for the Futurama crew as well. The character models felt a little wonky sometimes, Leela's proportions seemed to change a ton in her first few shots, and this first shot of Hermes looked extra weird. Okay, this one actually made me laugh though. Look at Bender in this hologram shot. <laughs> extra wide Bender. Thanks to our chubby robot friend. 
friend. They also did some other weird stuff with Bender. The episode involves them going into the back of Bender's head, which I believe has happened in Futurama before, but they also kept the detail of the little panel even before they go into it on the back of Bender's head, and it just looks a little off, since they never really showed that detail in the original series. Plus, they gave him this weird laser power, which was definitely something he didn't have in the original run. Also, they gave him a tongue for this scene. Very unsettling. They also decided to give Futurama fans an extra little gut punch by making Fry walk past Seymour, still waiting for him to return. Obviously, this doesn't make any sense canonically, as Panucci's Pizza was not in Springfield. Plus, Seymour dies in 2012, and this is set in 2016. They just really like to make us cry about that damn dog, don't they? But obviously, these are all minor nitpicks and don't affect my enjoyment of the episode all that much. The episode ends on a really nice note. After the Planet Express crew goes back to the future, Bender turns himself off and waits in the Simpsons' basement for 1,000 years until he can wake up again and go on living his life in the future. This is actually the same method used in both Bender's Big Score and another J. Stewart Burns Futurama episode, Roswell That Ends Well. But what works so great about this is this little moment between Homer and Bender. Thanks, pal. I see this as a nice little send-off from the Simpsons crew to the Futurama crew. We know the show is over, but we love ya and we'll miss ya. And we'll take care of your corpse in the basement. Now there's no real reason to think that this episode is canon for either the Simpsons or Futurama, since we know that the Simpsons is a fictional series in the world of Futurama, and Futurama is a fictional series in the world of the Simpsons, plus the aforementioned Seymour sequence. Although we do see Bender's body float out of the Simpsons' basement in a later Simpsons episode when their basement floods, but Simpsons continuity is a whole different can of worms. So with the completion of Simpsons so Rama, let's jump into the final lost episode, Radio Rama. In 2017, Futurama released a very mediocre mobile game called Futurama Worlds of Tomorrow, a free-to-play adventure that did feature microtransactions if you wanted to skip ahead, which led to this Simsurama joke looking pretty outdated. Find out why people would ever pay for freemium games. But a couple of pretty great things came from the Worlds of Tomorrow game, including the production of a Futurama audio adventure featured on the Nerdist podcast. The host of that podcast, uh... What was, what was his name again? Chris Hardwick. Ah, yeah, thanks, Professor. He contacted David X. Cohen about the idea of resurrecting Futurama again in the radio play format. Fortunately, they were in the middle of producing Futurama Worlds of Tomorrow and were able to use the marketing budget from the game in order to produce this audio adventure. You can listen to this audio-only adventure on YouTube, Spotify, and anywhere that carries the Nerdist podcast. Just Google it, you should be able to find it. They were able to get the entire cast back, plus writers Ken Keeler and Patrick Verone to help David X. Cohen pen the script. While it certainly doesn't quite have the same effect as a fully animated episode, Radio Rama gave us some final performances from our favorite characters and had a lot of charm. While I'm not going to get too detailed on the plot, and I'll be honest here, it's mostly because of the lack of B-roll, I will jump into some vague spoilers now. Spoilers ahead for Radio Rama. If you want to avoid spoilers, jump to the following time code. Not unlike the Futurama game, this episode plays around with the fact that it's in the audio format. The premise revolves around all my circuits being resurrected as a podcast. Yeah, pretty on the nose meta commentary, and features a sci-fi premise that truthfully could not really be animated, which to me is a good use of the format. Since there are not visuals for the episode, Maurice LaMarche acts as the narrator, which works pretty well, and each of the three acts are segmented by fun little future radio ads, including a lot for the Futurama Worlds of Tomorrow mobile game, which obviously funded the entire project. The story has Bender offered to reprise his role of Antonio Calculon Jr. on All My Circuits, a callback to the episode Bender should not be allowed on TV, and Bender's desire for his mother to see him perform in the role. There's also a subplot about Fry creating a three-dimensional sculpture of Leela that she can't perceive since she only has one eye, which causes her to break up with him. Honestly, I hope that by now, years after the show ended, they'd stop with the will they won't they fry and Leela stuff, but I guess it is classic Futurama in a way. The villain of the episode is also voiced by the Nerdist podcast host, uh, what was his name again? Chris Hardwick. Right, right, thanks. The character named Klaxon is described to resemble a sound wave, and he's a creature who is upset that nobody ever listened to his podcast, which results in the Earth being swarmed by 58 million podcasts all at once. There's some funny sequences of sound design with all of the podcasts playing at the same time. They eventually are able to contain Klaxon in a Daimondium shell and save the Earth from audio doom. Daimondium, of course, being introduced back in The Beast with a Billion Backs. Honestly, the overall premise is a little sweaty and they have to do some heavy lifting to get it to work in the audio format, but it's definitely worth a listen overall. There are tons of fun references and callbacks to the original run of the series, and it was the last time we would ever get a full story performance from these characters. Radiorama is definitely my least favorite 
to Futurama's Lost Adventures, but I'm not taking any Futurama content for granted these days. I'm just glad we got it, and it was a pretty fun time overall. And while these are the only three fully fleshed out and scripted Futurama adventures that exist outside of the original run of the series, there are actually a couple more fun little extras for you to check out. The Bender's Big Score DVD has a full-length episode of Everybody Loves Hypnotoad, which is, admittedly, mostly just this. But it does have some cute little flourishes here and here if you really want to sit through the entire thing. I know this was budgetarily a very easy thing to produce, but I really wish at some point they had made a full length episode of like All My Circuits or The Scary Door. Honestly, I would watch the crap out of either of those. And the last piece of Futurama content you can enjoy after you've watched it all is once again, thanks to the Worlds of Tomorrow mobile game. While these don't offer a fully fleshed out story and mostly just set up the premise of the game, four fully animated trailers were produced for Worlds of Tomorrow and they're pretty funny. Just search Worlds of Tomorrow trailers on YouTube and you can find them all. One is a full two minutes and 40 seconds and features some really great gags. Don't worry, Leela. Love is stronger than gravity. Yeah! But what is it? And it's the closest thing we got to a story in any of these. These would ultimately be the final time we ever saw these characters fully animated. I'm still holding out hope that maybe one day we'll see one final Futurama movie, but not like the movies in season five. I'm talking like a full proper three act cinematic epic. It's not likely, but a man can dream, right? A man can dream. I know I used that same joke in another Futurama video, but it just works great, okay? So just cut me some slack, thank you. And there you have it. If you finished all 140 episodes of Futurama and are jonesing for one last hit, hopefully this helped you out with three more hits. If you're a Futurama diehard and haven't experienced this stuff, it is absolutely worth checking out, and I hope you enjoy. Do me a favor, let me know down below in the comments what you think of these extracurricular Futurama stories. Do they hold up to the original series run? Were they worth your time? Give me your thoughts. If you like this video, please hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for lots more Futurama content in the future. Peace. Johnny